Continuing on with my vinyl collection series, this is now part 23. Finishing up the H's, going to start and finish the I's and end on the J's within this part. The only other thing to talk about is going to be what's playing in the background, and that's going to be Maleficent, Night of Eternal Darkness. I have seen so many people on my Facebook friends list talk highly about this band, and while it's just really, you know, less Legion's noir worship style of black metal, a bit being very raw and harsh, it's just actually well written at the same time too, because riffs on here are just, you know, hard hitting and don't just rely so much on the harshness and rawness to sell you on it. So, yeah, if you're a fan of the less Legion's noir, especially Mutilation and uh, Vlad Tempest, you'll definitely dig this. So, uh, yeah, again, that's Maleficent. Part 23 is going to start off with the third full-length album by Human Serpent for I, the Mythanthropist. I have two vinyl copies of it, and I'll explain why in a second. But yes, Human Serpent, one of my favorite black metal bands based out of Greece, along with just one of my favorite black metal bands in general, because I discovered them in 2015 with their sophomore full-length album, which was Inhumane Minimalism, which, by the way, for the love of God, if this fucking album could get a vinyl press, that would make my goddamn life already, because I've been waiting so long for that. But after that, I've just been a diehard fan of them, and time and time again, with all their releases of their EPs and splits and full-lengths, it's just always been top-notch, aggressive black metal. And while their songwriting is nothing groundbreaking, and it's nothing you haven't heard before, it's just so ungodly reliable because their influences are very spread out. Whereas most black metal bands, their influences just stem from either one or two bands. Human Serpents, it's like, there's like, you could easily pick out like half a dozen types of influences from other black metal bands. Because you could say they take influence from Mahua, Necromantia, Horna, Sargeist, Kraft, like, it's just really spread out, and just, again, their song is just so reliable that you're going to get so many different, you know, uppercuts and lefts and rights and hooks of different styles of aggression for black metal within each album, and it's just always so top-notch, as I stated. Tracks on here like Seven Billion Slaves, Bride the Mythanthropist, Temple of All Despair, Us and Them, which is easily my favorite track on here, and Deep-Seated Pessimism top-notch. Can't recommend these guys enough if you just want very reliable, aggressive black metal time and time again. But other than that, as I stated, this is their third full-length album. I'm not sure if it's still available, but I know maybe Discogs or places like that would still carry copies, and yeah, I'm happy to see that these guys are gaining more and more steam with each release that they do. Now, as I showed earlier, I have two different vinyl uh, copies of this. And the reason for that is because back when this album was released in, I want to say it was either the beginning of 2018? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was the beginning of 2018. Um, I got this, bought it, did a review for it, and they actually ended up watching that, and they felt uh, so honored by my review, even though I really didn't do it with any strings attached, I just wanted to review this album. They threw in a special copy, and that special copy comes with the regular plain black vinyl, which just to show it, the center label has, you know, A, and obviously the other side would be B, but when I opened it up too, it also included another LP included with it. And as you can see right here, the sleeve is in red, and the center labels are white, and that is because Human Serpent, for my special vinyl edition, they gave me the test press of this album, and because of that, since I want to keep this mint, I bought another copy of this album to play just the regular standard vinyl edition of it, so uh, yeah, if I wasn't already a diehard fan of them to begin with, this just only amplified my you know, enjoyment for them even more. But as for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, and as well too, comes on a gatefold. Unsurprisingly as well, I have their latest album that was released earlier this year, Heirlooms Eternal. I'm going to keep this brief and quick because I did an album review for it, and if you really want to know all the details of what I think about this, check out my album review that I did for it a few months ago. But yeah, unsurprisingly for my standards, they, uh, lived up to my expectations and then some because again it's a straightforward aggressive black metal 
that again, you don't really need to be a black metal fan to really enjoy just the aggression that's just put out with any of their releases. But um, this was quite delayed, this record, because the pre-orders were put up in January, and I didn't get my copy until like late April, and that's because the uh, pressing plant fucked up, apparently, the uh, first copies that they did for it. And after finally doing another pressing for of the right uh, non-defective ones, you're going to get the standard black vinyl of it, you know, the center labels all normal, blah, blah, blah. But all the pre-orders also come with a second pressing of this record. And they decided instead of throwing them away, they used it to uh, put with all the pre-orders um, the, the defective ones that state on it. I don't know if it's going to pick up, but there's all like carved right into the grooves right there. You can kind of see it a little bit. Again, they're just carved with either like a knife or like a house key or something. And it says, again, if you can see it within the grooves, um, fuck normality. And the other side says, fuck the system. So, yeah, they throw in the defective records as well. Other little tidbits, I guess, just to feel sorry for all the guys who pre-ordered them like I did, who had to wait. Comes with a patch, again, with, that says fuck normality, kind of like the slogan for this record. As for the layout and packaging, you have Almar Orc, backside with the track listings, as well, too, comes on a gatefold. The final record within my vinyl collection part that starts with H is going to be Hurasama with War. This is one of the rarer records within my vinyl collection within the whole black metal spectrum because this got a one and only time pressing back in 1998 or 7, I believe, and it's limited to 100 copies. It's hard to come by, as I stated, and they're really not in the best condition because all of them are over 20 years old. I mean, this one isn't either. You can see there's a lot of ring wear on it, seam splits on the top. But thankfully, the record is unharmed and still playable. But for all those who don't know, Hurasama was a one-man black metal project based out of Japan. And the overall approach for this band is just, or project I should say, is just really straightforward, vicious, raw black metal that is just absolutely killer. And if memory serves me right, this was originally released on cassette tape, but it wasn't called War. It was called, um... I want to say Welcome to Hurasong World, I think. God, hopefully I'm right on there. And then they were uh, repressed it, as you can see, a year later, and just called it War. And the only difference besides the uh, title of each release is that the last two tracks on the vinyl edition come with uh, bonus tracks, which is uh, Open My Black Grave and uh, Sombre Metal. And uh, yeah, that's really the only two differences, along with the uh, Almar work, is just the dude's face. But yeah, if you're in the mood for just, you know, riff-heavy, vicious black metal, this will definitely hit the spot because it's just really, really good. Not too many people talk about this project, sadly, because if you're in the mood for just good and some of the best Japanese black metal, Hurasama should definitely be one of the names that are mentioned within that conversation. As for the layout and packaging, however, it's very bare bones. You have Almar Orc, backside with all the track listings and credits about the record, and all vinyl presses come on a standard black LP. As of this moment, we have entered the eyes within my vinyl collection. Kicking off this letter is going to be Igor with the third full length album, Nostril. I would love to own the first two records by Igor on LP, but they've technically never gotten their own vinyl presses, but you can get them because there was a compilation uh, two LP set for it, but that just goes for stupid money online, so that's just kind of like out of the question for me to get, so hopefully one day they will get their own individual vinyl presses, but thankfully I have Nostril on uh, LP because this album right here, I remember discovering it around the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015, blew my mind because I just really didn't know how to process music like this during this time because it, for a lot of metal fans I've noticed the ways that they have discovered the music genre known as breakcore I can guarantee you is because of Igor because 
Igor seems to play around a lot with extreme metal, which I feel like is, makes it just so appealing for metal fans because Igor blends breakcore, death metal, um, broke, classical, glitch, electronic, folk, you name it, in some way, shape, or form, I can guarantee you the style and subgenre of music is kind of you know, laced within Igor's approach and is just so ungodly weird and over the top that for some people it will definitely turn you off to uh, the over the top weird wacky sounds of Igor and for other people that are just looking for something just really out there that just really tests the waters of what you can do with just music I feel like Igor would definitely appeal to you because they're kind of like at the top of the food chain of weird music out there Tracks in here like Double Monk, Excessive Funeral, Very Long Chicken, um, <laughs> song titles, uh, Dentist, Half a Pony, um, really showcases the weirdness you can find within Igor. And Nostril, as weird as this sounds me saying this, in the most traditional sense of breakcore, this is like the more straight, kind of straightforward approach that you would find within the catalog of Igor within Breakcore. But other than that, for the layout and packaging of this record, you have the very weird album artwork. Backside with track listings, I gotta brag about it. This is the first press put up through Ad Nauseum. Comes on double LP and every vinyl pressing that is of the first press comes on this lime green variant. Thankfully, about, I wanna say, the beginning of 2020, only a year ago, Nuclear Blast finally did represses for this record. So if you want to get Nostril on the LP format, go straight to Nuclear Blast. Continuing on with even more Igor, I have the follow-up full length, that being Hallelujah, my personal favorite within the discography of Igor. Because while it's arguably a tad bit more tamed compared to the previous three full lengths, I feel like the production value and just overall execution is just so much more monumental that even when they play in the weird, wacky, crazy style of breakcore, it just feels so climactic in every sense that's always made it just such the standout for me personally with, uh, within the Igor discography that, God, this album is absolutely incredible. The opening track uh, right here, which I can't pronounce, it's this one right there. Um, this track is just so incredible to kick off the album because you have Warray singing and it gets all tender and sweet and very opera-like and then when the electronic and glitch moments kick in, her vocals just do like these crazy over-the-top shrieks and yells and it just really sets the tone for the album perfectly. As well too, of course, we got to talk about the track Vegetable Soup, which has a a breakdown section within the middle of it of a chicken clucking. This shit's weird, but it's so incredible. I just I can't stress it enough. Other great tracks on here are a damaged wig, lullaby for a fat jelly, <laughs> lullaby for a fat jellyfish, and uh, as well too. There's also a lot of guest spots um, within this because I believe um, one of the tracks. I think it's absolute palm. And the opening track has the guitarist from Mayhem uh, do some guest spots with the uh, guitar work within this album. So again, the extreme metal sections you will find within Igor are still present within it. But again, I can't stress it enough, it's just way more climactic. As for the layout and packaging, however, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings. Comes on a gatefold with all the credits. And one thing that's really funny that I gotta point out with the credits is that at the very bottom with vegetable soup, they actually credited the ch <laughs> the chicken Patrick. This, however, is a first press put up through Ad Noiseum that comes on a crystal clear vinyl. And just like Nostril that I pointed out, this as well too finally got a vinyl repress put up through Nuclear Blast. So if you want to get either Nostril or Hallelujah, go to Nuclear Blast. I also have the collaboration EP by Igor and Ruby My Dear called uh, Megra. Apparently in French this translates to skinny, which I guess has something to do with this dog right here. I don't know what the exact context is, but uh, this EP collaboration is more of the sense of the electronic approach that Igor does within his songwriting because 
The whole extreme metal aspect that a lot of people enjoy about Igor really isn't found within this collaboration. I feel like the collaboration part with Ruby My Dear kind of taking over the other half of it kind of uh, affects the overall craziness. It's still very interesting and for a lot of people that are fans of Igor, they would argue that the first half, everything before before Igor got signed to Metal Blade is his best work that's still very unpredictable and it seemed like he always challenged himself along with the listeners of just how crazy and avant-garde his approach can be with great core. And it's still very interesting for what it is and I'm very lucky that I got this because uh, I remember getting all of the Igor records for dirt cheap. I'm talking like 20 bucks at the most and that includes shipping and handling. It was so easy to get. Ever since he got signed to Metal Blade, they immediately skyrocketed to triple, you know, digit prices. It's so insane. So, I'm lucky that I even own this to begin with. But as for the layout and packaging right here, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, and this final press comes on semi-translucent red. Moving on within the Igor discography, I also have the fifth full length by Igor, that being Savage, Sinusoid. I also have two copies of this record because this LP right here is signed by all the members back when I saw them in 2018, so that's why I got a spare copy of it. But yes, Igor, Savage, Sinusoid, this is the first record that was, uh, put out through Igor under the label of Metal Blade. And I remember finding out and seeing the news article that Igor was signed to Metal Blade, and I was stunned. I never thought Igor, this weird, crazy blend of breakcore, bro classical, and hints of extreme metal, would be on the label of Metal Blade, but it happened. And when that happened, his popularity for this project exploded tenfold. And that's why you see a lot of uh, metal fans really have a lot of fascination with Igor, especially when that moment happened. But because of it, I feel like there were a lot of pros and cons to it. One of the big pros is the fact that thanks to his popularity, that's why we're getting represses of his early works. Hell, it's, the, it's a massive reason as to why I even seen the project live back in 2018. Because I remember seeing an interview that... Um, Gautier stated that he would never do touring within the states of Igor because all the popularity of the project was in Europe, so obviously he would stick with just touring there. So I was convinced for years I am not ever going to have the chance to see Igor unless I were to fly cost, you know, across the country to Europe to do so. And I remember seeing the, um, you know, a flyer for the tour and that Igor would do in 2018, and I, and I honestly thought it was fake. Like, I could not process that that was real, and I still can't believe I've actually seen it. It, it was just ugh, such a bucket list moment for me. But with all the pros of that, the cons, however, is I feel like Igor's musical approach with, you know, breakcore has been really tamed ever since the release of Savage Sinusoid and being signed to Metal Blade. Because I know this is going to be really weird for me to say, but the most normal thing about Igor is when he plays extreme metal. It's the most familiar sounding. Everything that makes Igor weird and different and avant-garde is when he blends electronic and breakcore and broke and classical. All that like abstract stuff that isn't really familiar for you know metal fans, that's what makes Igor weird. The extreme metal moments arguably are the most normal thing about it. And I feel like he's just bringing the influences that he did with Horker with Igor, but a lot of the metal sections, again, are just tamed. Like, they're just a lot of, like, heavy breakdowns that kind of ruins the pacing in some way. I don't know, I just feel like it, it affected it in some regards, and this has always been my least favorite within the discography of Igor. But one track I, I really actually enjoy quite a lot is uh, the track Spaghetti Forever because uh, during the, I believe, outro of that track, there's like this 8-bit like outro sounding video game soundtrack within it that is just so weird. And that's the type of shit I want within Igor. I want him to always challenge the listener of just what you can do with breakcore and blending all these styles together. That's what's, again, always sold me about this project. But other than that, I mean, 
This is really easy to get. Pretty sure Metal Blade keeps this, you know, widely in print. They do like a repress for it like every year. So if you really want to get this record, go to Metal Blade. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings. Comes within these printed inner sleeves that are just, again, very butt ugly looking. But the first record comes on this kind of like, I guess, gold marble looking color. And the other LP pressing that I have, that was the signed copy, comes on the semi-translucent kind of like aqua looking blue type of color. The last record I have that is pertaining to Igor is going to be Spirituality and Distortion. This was released last year. I did an album review for it, so if you want my opinion of it in greater detail, check out my review for it. And while it's still having a lot of attention to detail with the extreme metal aspect with Igor, I would definitely say at least it's a step up from Savage Sinusoid because the teaser track that they uh, released for this album was uh, Very Noise. And I remember seeing the music video for it as f so weird and crazy as it is, is more like the sense and style of what I expect Igor to have, as it has more of like that break core, you know, drum and bass approach with it, with a really jazzy bass line that is very entertaining. But the standout track for me personally within this album is Paranoid Bulldozer Italiano. That is vintage Igor that really is just crazy and over the top sounding. That is definitely the standout track. But again, the thing I'm just not really that crazy for about this album is there's just a lot more extreme metal. Because I know one of the tracks has a guest spot of uh, Corpse Grinder from Cannibal Corpse in here that, uh, I don't know, I, I think he's just realizing now his fan base has a lot more metal fans than before. Regardless, it's still entertaining for what it is, and um, if you want to get it, again, Metal Blade should still carry copies. But as for the layout and packaging, this is really cool, because as you can see, there's a cut going right there, and all f uh, records come within these printed inner sleeves, and as you can see, when you change it, so with this side, we'll just have the uh, camel with a uh, disco ball. You put that in the front of it, and now all the people are freaking out about a camel with a disco ball. As well, too, since it's a double LP pressing, side C and D also have some imagery of the printed in our sleeves. This has a giant chicken on uh, fire with the eyes on fire and the stereo on fire along with the other side of just the track listings. This does come on a gatefold with just hieroglyphics to kind of depicting each track within the album. And this LP pressing comes on uh, Amber Tiger Eye, I think that's what it's called, limited to 100 copies. Next up is the debut full-length album by Infernal Requiem, Gloomy Night. This right here is a one-man black metal project from Taiwan that I would say it's arguably the first ever black metal project out of that country formed in 1999. And while it's doing, again, nothing new for the genre, it's just really raw, cold, evil, blasphemous black metal, I think it's just a staple name for the country, for the sound, for black metal within Taiwan. And that's really the selling point here. Other than that, I mean, it's good. For the most part, the drum, the drum machines on this can be quite clunky and annoying, but the overall vocal uh, execution and approach I really admired a lot within this album, that if you're a fan of like Black Solis to an extent, you might dig this. But yeah, other than that, it's uh, put it through Go To Work. So again, another part with my final collection, that's a Go To Work's release. But uh, for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, double LP, and this is the second press that comes on crystal clear vinyl. Moving on next to Insect Warfare, World Extermination. For a lot of people that enjoy Grindcore, they argue that this is the best Grindcore album ever made. And while I really enjoy this album a lot, it's very just, you know, high energy, straightforward, pummeling Grindcore. I don't really see it as like the best thing ever for the genre. It's just more of the traditional sense of like when Grindcore started out in the late, late 80s, but just with the modern production value attached with it. That again, it definitely deserves a lot of the appraise that it gets, and obviously I enjoy it as I own it, 
but I wouldn't say it's the best within the genre for me personally. But uh, regardless, you guys all know this album, and thankfully it's been getting a lot of represses because I think last year it got some uh, represses. So if you want it, there's definitely copies out there for a reasonable price. But how I got this, again, talking about this uh, record store, was Purchase Street. Somehow this dude managed to get like a used copy of this for under 30 bucks. Had to get it. Because um, while all the tracks kind of stand shoulder to shoulder with each other, so it's kind of pointless even naming any of these tracks, it's just, again, very humbling sounding. And the vocals on here are just yeesh. They are extreme and just vicious throughout and very harsh too. That um, every now and then I spin this and it definitely hits the spot if I'm in the mood for just no bullshit grindcore. And I remember actually catching these guys live. Uh, I think it was the 2017 uh, Maryland Death Fest, which was pretty cool because I know this was like when they did like just a few reunion shows. But yeah, Insect Warfare, you guys should all know this if you're a grindcore fan. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork backside with the track listings. Comes with an insert sheet with artwork, and this is all the lyrics with each song. And this LP pressing comes on semi-translucent purple. Oh boy, yes, and now we have finally reached this fan within my vinyl collection series. Next up, Intestine Balsam. An anatomy of the beast. <laughs> oh my god. This is like ultimate melodic death metal. I said it before once a few years ago when I made a list of my top 10 favorite all time um, death metal albums. If you ever heard someone say that all melodic death metal sucks, it's weak, it's trash, you know, it's just <clears throat> non alcoholic vodka, they don't know this. Show them this, that way they can look like a complete, giant, fucking jackass. This stuff is fucking incredible and just pulverizing. It is so insanely good melodic death metal that uh, if more bands sounded like this within the subgenre of melodic death metal, this genre would have so much more respect. That I would argue, as much as we want to say Argus Lint, is the best melodic death metal band. For me personally, they come second to Intestine Balsam. All three albums that they have done are 10 out of 10s. They're, they're just perfection in the best way possible. That You can almost even say it's like brutal melodic death metal because the vocals on here are just monstrous sounding and uh, I just, I can't give them enough credit for what they do. And hopefully one day they'll do another follow-up because if you look within their discography, I know they have one demo that contains like three tracks, but all three full lengths, uh, the release dates of them are widely spread out within like eight plus years. So they, they told me once in a Instagram message like a year or two ago they're working on a fourth full length, which if that happens, I'll be all over that like white on rice. But Within their discography, an Anatomy of the Beast, I would say, is like the heaviest of the three that they've done. And it will definitely change your viewpoint on melodic death metal, just trust me on that. But yeah, tracks on here like the title track, Blasphemy, Resurrected, A Place Their Gods Left Behind, and uh, Tyrant. So good, so, so good. And I'm very lucky I scored a copy of this. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listings, limited to 250 copies. I got number 104. Comes on a standard black vinyl along with an insert sheet with the band logo and lyrics on the other side. The only other record I have by Intestine Balsam is their latest album from 2008, that being Ultimate Instinct. Let me start off by saying if anybody can do a vinyl press of Banquet in the Darkness, that would be awesome, because it really bothers me that it never got a vinyl press. But anyway, Ultimate Instinct, my favorite within the catalog of Intestine Balsam, because while all three are just 10 out of 10s, this I would say is the most atmospheric sounding, that it propels them more than just being a heavy melodic death metal band, and honestly it's some of the best death metal I've heard in general within the whole genre, because it is just so incredible 
incredible that they're this heavy, yet this atmospheric at the same time. Tracks on here like Cry for the Black Sun, Galaxy of the Black Sun, um, Ultimate Instinct, The Massacre, Dark Surface, Wind of Death, which is such an atmospheric and gorgeous yet pummeling song. Oh, this shit is just incredible. I have nothing negative to say about this band. And again, really hoping they do a follow-up to it, because if it's even half as good as this, I'm sold. So definitely, I strongly recommend, if you want to have your mind change with melodic death metal, and you hope more death metal bands take this influence for the style of melodic death metal, check out Intestine Balls, and I can't stress that enough. As for the layout and packaging, however, with this record, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, again, limited to 300 copies, I got number 127. Comes on a standard black vinyl, but again, insert sheet with lyrics along with a band picture and more lyrics. Picking up within this vinyl collection part, next up is going to be Iskra with their album Ruins. This is a blend of like, crust punk, grindcore, and somewhat black metal, it's more like a blackened uh, crust grind band. That I feel like if you're a fan of the mid-era portion within the discography of Dark Throne, stuff like, you know, FOAD and Circle the Wagons, you might find a bit of enjoyment with Iskra's Ruins. Because the riffs on here are very aggressive and the overall album is just very straightforward. I think it's just well-written, kind of like crusty, dark grindcore, and that's really about it. That's all I've got to say about this band. Because the rest of the discography, decent, but Ruins is quite the standout. And, I don't know, I have quite a bit of fun listening to this album. Other than that, for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listing. Comes on a standard black vinyl, along with a big-ass booklet, with just lyrics to go along with all the tracks and uh, credits at the end of it. Second to last for this part is going to be the soundtrack for Jack and Dexter. Let me start off by saying Jack and Dexter is better than Ratchet and Clank. Go fuck yourself if you think differently. That is something that I will admit triggers me when people say Ratchet and Clank is better than Jack and Dexter. It is not. Ratchet and Clank has guns that ooh, go boom and go all crazy and all over the place. Jack and Dexter has a good fucking story. Please, people, don't tell me that you think Ratchet and Clank is better than Jack and Dexter because it's not. Anyway, the music within... <laughs> raging and getting all triggered over a, vi a fucking video game. Anyway, Jack and Dexter, the soundtrack for this is just pure nostalgia for me, okay? I don't even care if some of these tracks are just filler or they're just more like the background music for the missions. It is just pure blissful nostalgia that I just, I love. I've always loved this video game series. I remember playing Jack and Dexter, the Precursor Legacy, on the PS2 when I was six years old when it was released. And I remember graduating the first grade, and my parents got me the PS2 for me graduating it. And I was just like, this is the game I see on TV, advertised on the commercials, I'm actually playing it. Because to go from a Sega Genesis to the PS2 and seeing graphics like this during its time. Six-year-old me couldn't contain himself. But yes, as I stated, pure nostalgia is right here within the grooves of the records for this because to kind of talk about the music, I guess, since you know this is the whole point of this series, uh, the Precursor Legacy is more of like the you know, light-hearted sounds that really gives like a vibe of adventure and exploration. Jack 2 is more like dystopian, aggressive in some sense, like the beats just feel more urgent. Jack 3 feels a bit more, I guess, 
ancient and kind of more monumental as it's kind of like building up to a climax. And there's all bonus tracks of just unused uh, stuff. They, they use uh, unused material for uh, the game, so that's pretty neat. But yeah, Jack and Dexter, the, <laughs> the soundtrack for it. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, and even more artwork. Comes on a gatefold with, again, more artwork, kind of like that, similar to that of Jack 3. Printed inner sleeve, so you have side 1 of Dark Jack, side 2 with some track listings with it. And the second printed inner sleeve, side 3, has White Jack, along with the track listings on the other side. As for the vinyl variants, they both come on two different colors. Side A and B is that of yellow, similar to that of Jack's hair. And side C and D come on orange, similar to that of Dexter. And the final record for this vinyl collection part is going to be George Sliade. This is a compilation of their first two EPs. And man, this is such awesome raw black metal. It's not in the sense of it just being harsh and raw and ooh, you only gotta be a black metal fan to enjoy it. This is the only raw black metal band that I would attach the uh, adjective of that, of it being melodic. It's the only one I've ever come across that the best way to explain this band is think of like you were to go to a festival that just specifically only had raw black metal bands and George Sliate was a part of it and there's ten bands all together. The first nine would have just the people be in awe at how raw the black metal bands are, that they would just stand there and just appreciate, you know, the cold, eerie rawness of those bands. And when George C.A. came on, it'd be the only band within that festival where you would see people moshing to them. It is very just upbeat, melodic, raw black metal that I just don't come across that, man, I hope this band continues on because this compilation of their first two EPs sounds insanely promising and I know they released a, uh, a third EP that's on a 7 inch that again still carries on that very melodic upbeat somewhat punkish type of a uh, melodic uh, black metal approach that I really hope they do a full length because if it sounds anything like this I'm sold and um, yeah definitely if you want more of the melodic sense of raw black metal George Lee definitely get familiarized with these guys. The only thing negative to say about it, which fucking sucks, the packaging and layout. That's all I'm going to say. Comes on a standard black vinyl and an insert sheet with credits of the guys and just the you know, backside of it. And that's really all I have to say about that. But yeah, that's it for this final collection part. Like always, guys, links will be provided to everything I've talked about in the description below. And that is that. So like always, guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated and have a great day.